Now we are moving on to our first plenary discussion, this next session. Now, this is a dialogue, this is a conversation where Men Engage has brought together leading voices. They will share their views on how gender, patriarchy, uh, masculinities, how these shape the world we live in today. And of course, a reflection on the challenges that we face and the opportunities. This is the part that always, always excites me when it comes to the space of activism and policy making. Opportunities for solidarity, transformation and cooperation, because without these powerful collaborative efforts, then we will not make any, any impact at all. I'm delighted to welcome our moderator for this next session and uh, Bandana Rana. Bandana is the vice chair of uh, the CEDAW committee, a key leader of the women's movement in Nepal and the region and her experience spans three decades of promoting women's rights. We can't wait to hear from you, Bandana, and your panel. Thank you so much, Reditabi. I hope I'm heard. Yes. Thank you so much, everyone, and for that kind introduction. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, and a very, very warm welcome to all those who have joined the opening of this Men Engage Ubuntu Symposium from all around the world. Namaste, that's from where I come from, greetings, and a very, very warm greetings from Nepal. These are unprecedented times that require and provide opportunity for new forms of organizing and leadership based on power with and deep interconnectedness. And that is exactly what this symposium aims to galvanize with its theme, Ubuntu, I am because you are. And Ubuntu weaves into the main themes and topics of the symposium, connecting and amplifying the voices of various movements, coming together and sharing power with and knowledge to deliberate, discuss and share diverse thoughts and perspectives on feminism, intersectionality, building accountability, and transforming masculinity. With these objectives, we keenly look forward to making this a truly learning and gratifying experience for all of us involved, moving beyond protocol, breaking binaries between high level and community leadership. And at our table, may I inform you that we are all considered leaders. The discussions at this first round of the plenary represent leading voices from various sectors and approaches. They will take stock and shine their light on where we go from here with their views on how gender, patriarchy and masculinities influence and shape the world today. They will set the stage for the scale and scope of today's challenges and the opportunities for solidarity, transformation, and cooperation for gender, social, and environmental justice. May I introduce the distinguished discussants of this first round of the opening plenary. Ms. Asas Regner of Sweden. She's the Assistant Secretary General of the United Nations and Deputy Executive Director of UN Women since May 2018. Ms. Regner served since 2014 as Minister for Children, the Elderly and Gender Equality of Sweden, where her focus was on concrete results in the implementation of Swedish gender equality policies, as well as a shift towards prevention of violence against women and the involvement of men and boys in gender equality work. She has extensive experience in the area of gender equality and women's empowerment, having held various leadership positions in government and NGOs, as well as the United Nations. Our next discussant or speaker is Mr. Darren Walker, the president of the Ford Foundation, a $13 billion social justice philanthropy with offices in the US and 10 global regions. For two decades, he has been a leader in the nonprofit and philanthropic sectors. He serves on the boards of several business and social companies. Educated exclusively in public schools, 
Darren was a member of the first Head Start class in 1965 and received his bachelor's and law degrees from University of Texas at Austin. And our next speaker is a young youth, Lucas Grimson from Argentina. He's a political science student at the University of Buenos Aires. He works on the intrigual rights of adolescents and young people and is active on a platform to question masculinities. He is also a young member of the Directorate of Adolescents and Youth Ministry of Health Argentina. And our last speaker of the discussant of uh, this plenary session is Ms. Gitanjali Misra, who is the co-founder and executive director of CRIA from India. She is a feminist and a film buff who has worked at the activist grant making and policy levels on issues of sexuality, reproductive health, gender, human rights, and violence against women. Gita has served as co-chair, president, and advisor for multiple organizational boards. Presently, she is serving member of the Astria Foundation Board and Amnesty International Task Force, Gender and Diversity. As an author, Gita has several publications to her name, including Reflections on the Inclusion of Men in Women's Rights Programs and Beyond Virtue and Vice, Rethinking Human Rights and Criminal Law. So I'm not now all set to begin this discussion, this dialogue with these very, very profound and distinguished discussants. And my first discussant is Asa Regni from UN Women. Ms. Regner, this is the year of Beijing plus 25 comm commemoration for, you know, something which everyone holds with a lot of significance, particularly if you are a women's rights activist. And someone was, if, if you have attended the Beijing conference, which I had the opportunity to attend and which led my road to activism. So as we know that Beijing Platform for Action actually called out to men and boys to take on their responsibility to dismantle patriarchy you have been leading the global UN agency for women's rights. And this is also the 10th anniversary of UN women. And you have been one of the advocates on the importance of engaging men and boys for gender equality. So what is your assessment of where we need to be and what we need to do today at this critical time for gender equality with men and boys as activists, advocates and allies for gender equality? And what does a gender equal post-COVID world look like? And what is the role that leaders need to be playing to get us there? Can we have some perspective from you within eight minutes of this, please? Thank you. Thank you so much, Pandana. And thank you, uh, uh, Men Engage Alliance and uh, all organizers for having me today. I'm very honored to be here. And uh, I think that this is a very energizing event because I really do believe that unless we manage to engage men and boys and also make use of the knowledge that we actually have today, we didn't 10, 20 years ago to the same extent, unless we make use of that knowledge of what works in terms of engaging men and boys and thus shifting power from men to women, uh, we will not succeed uh, in uh, building a future gender equal society. So thank you so much for that. I was also in Beijing 25 years ago and I've had the great uh, um, luck to be able to work with these issues since then in many different capacities. And I do think now that a very important thing, let me start with that, is for the next uh, generation, those who are uh, even younger than I was then, uh, uh, teenagers, um, men, and, um, men and women in their 20s and 30s, to be really shaping the future with us in, in relation to this. So uh, when, as you know, uh, we did take stock of what happened uh, in um, Beijing 25 years ago, uh, or sorry, what happened after the Beijing conference 25 years ago, since that is still the only action plan we have globally for gender equality. And um, we do see that uh, unless we all uh, come together and, and work on gender equality, uh, we, we will not reach results and we haven't. Uh, as you know, Bandana, the idea, the whole idea in Beijing 25 years ago was not just to throw 12 random areas together to have an action plan. The idea was really to shift power from men to women 
in a rightful and uh, in just way, since the analysis was that men have power because they are men. Uh, and, um, uh, and boys are born into power because they are boys at the expense of women. And the Beijing platform was a tool to make that power shift happen. But when we do take stock 25 years later, which you asked me about, we had the, gender, uh, the General Assembly exercise um, not uh, only a month ago, we also had an exercise, an event in the Security Council on, about the resolution 1325 on women's rights in armed conflict just a week ago. And when we take stock of these important uh, uh, documents, we see that that power shift has not happened. There is too much power in the hands of men in all uh, measurable ways, almost. The area where we have had a, a success is actually education, which is a very important one, where girls nowadays uh, attend school almost to the same, same extent as boys, at least pre-COVID. We also have managed to lower uh, the rates of maternal mortality, which is one of the goals as well in, uh, in the Beijing document. But we are not on track in the rest of sexual reproductive health and rights. For example, we are off track in relation to women's leadership. Uh, actually 90% of the countries in the world, 90% have not reached women's fair share of political power, which was a, a goal uh, in the Beijing platform. 75% of parliamentarians are already, are, are still uh, men. We also haven't reached the goals when it comes to women's employment rates uh, in paid uh, work. We have also not reached the goals when it comes to men's share of unpaid work. We also know that levels of violence against women uh, we have not been able to lower those levels and during COVID they also spiked as was mentioned uh, earlier and we estimate that the increase is around 20 to 30 percent of men being violent to women they know or are in some kind of relation to. So these are some examples of what has not happened uh, since 1995. Uh, and obviously we need now for um, men and boys and women and girls of all ages to engage and come forward with their um, both demands and their expectations and their, their propositions in relation to future. And I'll come back to how you and women is trying to gather all of that energy. Um, what has been a success though, although reality has not changed a lot, as I just said, is still political engagement. And this might sound strange because we have not seen political will enough to change the world. We have also not seen political will to fund the commitments uh, that were done in Beijing 25 years ago. But we have seen legislation. We have much better legislation in place. And actually in uh, most countries, we have some kind of provision when it comes to violence against women, which was not there 25 years ago. Uh, we also have other forms of uh, other forms of reforms. For example, uh, um, 90 countries have some kind of provisions for men's possibilities to take some time off with their newborn babies, which was not the case 25 years ago. So there has been some kind of political leadership when it comes to legislation and reforms, but that uh, political will was not there when it came to stepping up to actually changing the world because the money wasn't there and the political will to create systems for these changes to happen is still lacking. So I think we know what we have to do, but unless we engage everybody in the work to, to make reality change, we will not get there also not in another 25 years. So I think it's extremely important to have uh, men and boys uh, voices uh, in, uh, in this work. Uh, I think that uh, in the good news is, as I said before, we know quite a lot about what what we mean by that and what works. We have examples of, for instance, family law that has actually changed uh, the, uh, not the whole burden, but at least parts of it when it comes to unpaid care. 
We have countries where, where uh, legislation has been put in place but, and, and also implemented at least to some extent. We also have examples of uh, prevention in relation to violence when it comes to discussing gender norms and, and um, engaging men and boys against violence against women. Uh, we have examples of um, um, political pressure, let's say, on political parties to uh, support women candidates and actually for male candidates to stand back. Uh, we also have quota systems in place in many countries when it comes to women's political power, although they're not always used and implemented. So I think, um, Bandana, uh, to close, uh, UN Women's uh, initiative now to, to gather all the support we can for future gender equality work is an initiative called Generation Equality, where we also point out six areas for action. And you can see a lot about this in, on our webpage, uh, if you like. I think that also all of this work has become more important even uh, during and after COVID. But I do think, Bandana, I think that we from you and women, uh, he, we think obviously that he for she is a good initiative since we took the initiative to, to introduce it. But we have to fill that now with evidence-based, knowledge-based work and with engagement from men and boys. And we mean by that that man, men ca can support women in leadership roles. Men need to see their own privilege that they have as men. And they also need to support sisters. They need to show sisterhood with and brotherhood with women uh, in political parties, in workplaces, etc. Uh, we all need to facilitate for men to be fathers actively. We know that has a great impact on uh, gender norms. Uh, we also need for male leaders to demand that women leaders sit around the same tables as themselves in workplaces, uh, in politics, in peace processes, etc. We also need men to speak up against the violence against women and uh, watch their, uh, their own behavior and, and norms. And uh, we also, I think, have to see how gender norms have an influence on boys. I am, for instance, uh, worried that uh, since we see that in some countries, very young boys, suicide rates are uh, clearly higher than, than young girls suicide rates. Uh, and sometimes that is because uh, they didn't, so to speak, dare to reach out to ask for help because they were not supposed to be seen as weak or having needs. Or, or, and the healthcare systems also didn't ask if they had needs. So I think that a gender equal society, a future one is much uh, more um, welcoming, better will take, make use of everybody's resources and we are prepared to do anything we can to be part of that, the shaping of that society. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Asa, thank you so much. For particularly, you know, 20 years, 25 years after Beijing, this is a very, very important year with all those commitments. And you did point out uh, some of the things that have happened after Beijing, but some significant things uh, which hasn't happened, which is the mo mo most important being the power shift. So I think, um, you know, the suggestions that you have made about how men can be allies, I, I, I hope that, you know, I have been a very key part of the creation of UN Women with the civil society advocacy. And we really have very high hopes, uh, you know, in the, in the 10th anniversary of UN Women. We hope that through the generation equality, we were so very excited about it, that through the generation equality, we will be able to achieve and promote that shift, which is so very much required. So thank you so much. We are a bit shorter, you know, we're behind time and I'm actually requesting the speakers, my apologies, to shorten your uh, intervention by one minute. We had said nine minutes now, if we can do it in eight minutes, that would be excellent. So our next speaker is Mr. Darren Walker, the president of the Ford Foundation. As the president of Ford Foundation in your work, you are supporting social justice issues and movements on a broad range of issues. 
What is your greatest concern about the current state of our world? How do men, masculinities, power, and accountability contribute to the problem and in also finding a solution? How can we collectively resist worldwide challenges and be part of the global movement for transformation? I know these are very deep questions, but we can just have your brief perspectives on these, please. Thank you, Mr. Darren, the floor is yours. Thank you, Bandana. And on behalf of all of my colleagues at the Ford Foundation, I'm truly honored to be with you today. Let me begin by saying the thing that concerns me greatly in the world is the context in which this discussion is occurring. It is a context of growing authoritarianism. It is a context of recognition of the legacy of white supremacy, of colonialism that has contributed to the environment that has enabled so much of the toxic patriarchy that is at the center of the challenge before us. Let me say that I believe that as a donor, we are culpable for part of this problem. And we are culpable because we as donors have not put the problem solvers who are first and foremost women and women-led organizations in the global south at the center of our strategies. We have for too long privileged Northern organizations and leaders. We have privileged the credentialed over the leaders and people, the women and the men and boys who live in the very communities that we hope to impact. So let's talk about how we actually bring about solutions because the problem diagnosis is clear. Solutions will come only through collaboration and partnership. Solutions will only come from men and boys recognizing the implications, the harm that is done through the kind of toxic patriarchy that we are speaking of. And indeed, this is not good for men and boys either in the long run. And finally, we have to recognize the role of culture and the carriers of our culture who perpetuate and promote the kind of patriarchy and cultural norms and practices that are harmful to our aspirations for more equality, for greater equality. I think the kind of collaboration, of course, we are seeing that many of you are leading is critical, but we must continue to push ourselves to ask ourselves, why aren't we making more progress? I believe part of the reason we aren't making more progress is because of this power dynamic that uh, remains that seemingly uh, is propagated, uh, is instantiated into our systems. And this is why we must address and dismantle those systems. And we will do that both through attacking and addressing culture, but also in addressing it through policy. And this is why it is so important that the people gathered here at this important global conference recommit ourselves, not only to Beijing, but recommit ourselves to a future that is a future of justice, a future of equality, a future of equity, and a future that brings together men and women, boys and girls, because we cannot solve this challenge without the engagement of men and boys. But at the end of the day, 
if we believe in justice, we must put women and girls and women and girls in the global south at the center and not only put them at the center, not to objectify them, not to give them voice because they have voice, they have perspectives. It is our job to support them in elevating their voice, to resource them to be heard by influencers, by the powerful, by policymakers. And when we do this, I firmly believe we will see the kind of transformation that this planet so desperately needs. Thank you, Bandana. I think you're on mute, Bandana. I was just saying thank you so much, Darren. That was very, very powerful. The importance of collaboration, partnership to seek a solution. And what I like about what you said is putting the women of the global south at the center, I think, which is so very important. And also, uh, you know, the dismantling the toxic masculinity that is there and, and, and the re recommitment to a future of justice and equality. Thank you so much, Darren. I think you've summed it very, very well. Thanks a lot. And now we move on to our um, uh, next uh, speaker who is Ms. Gitanjali Misra, who is the executive director of CREA from India. Men Engage Alliance has in its mission statement that the work on engaging men and transforming masculine entities need to be informed by intersectional feminist approaches. For someone like you and your organization who are at the forefront on working with feminist approaches, what is a feminist approach to engaging with men and boys? What are the challenges? What needs to be done better? And what are the opportunities? Could you also share your views on the points of tensions and intersectionality? You have eight minutes, Gita. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Bandana, and thank you, Darren and Asa, for uh, saying the words authoritarianism, white supremacy, toxic patriarchy. You've made my work much easier. So as feminists, uh, we aim to critique, dismantle, and reshape power structures. And these power structures include diverse men and boys that face varying barriers, but also ones in which they have clear privilege because these systems disempower women as a class. So what I'm going to try to do here is in the first part, you know, uh, talk to you all about some thinking that we have done as a feminist organization around uh, the tension, the intersectionalities and the world we're facing today with COVID and increasing authoritarianism. And the second part is four ideas of how we approach our work. Uh, as a feminist organization, I think we're always asked, how do you work with men and boys? And we've become more sophisticated now with our answers because we do work with men and boys. However, we have a perspective of how we do it. And I think we have to consider the recent, in the recent years where we have witnessed significant changes in the lives of men, such as greater material vulnerability, lesser social security, under the neoliberal development regimes leading to a crisis of masculinity. And if you, and we all know that at this time, the idea of gender has changed. It's gone through a profound transformation. The neat binaries of men, women, within which the world and its people could be organized and civil society, social justice actors, governments could use to design programs and policies have increasingly been called into question. And these have resulted in striking at the roots of patriarchal and heteronormative power structures and resulted in a backlash that can be categorized as anti-gender politics. Uh, the anti-gender po politics stems from a fostering a deep sense of fear and vulnerability built around the crisis of masculinity. And one byproduct of this is the ideas of the strong male leader accompanied by a hyper-nationalist discourse 
uh, that is, an, you know, that is anti-immigration and in general detrimental to uh, women's human rights. So COVID-19 has exacerbated and brought into focus a notion of this strong male leader even more. And the pandemic has revealed deeply rooted inequalities and ableism still prevalent in our societies. And it has created more layers of men who, that, who some men whose lives are seen as more valuable in society than other men. Now, even if men benefit from the status quo relative to women, men are not a homo homogeneous category. And we all know that, but it's good to remind ourselves, depending on the context and the intersection of many identities, such as class, religion, caste, race, sexuality, a man may be at several points powerless and at many times privileged. And the notion of hegemonic masculinity does shape and our work at Priya around working on this issue of men and boys, because we know that men also experience social pressure to conform to dominant and socially, socially valued ideas of manhood. So I think it's important to now think about uh, not just why, but how do we do this work on men, with men? I, I for my, you know, the first thing we say as a feminist organization is, we should work with men for men's sake. Um, we, you know, that is an intrinsic approach. Working with men engages men, boys as full participants for their own sake. Women and girls may form part of this equation, but they're not the end. Men are not meant to save women. And we, you work with men only so that they will better the lot of women. And we have collected many examples where an instrumental approach in the end doesn't empower women. Uh, in, a, in a village that I worked in to lower the rates of anemia with women, uh, a male responsibility program asked, you know, explained to men the importance of women taking folic acid tablets. These men went home and thought they were doing a great thing by forcing women some slapping women to take their folic acid tablets. Uh, the anemia program had great success, but the violence against these women increased. So, you know, it's somewhere in between. We're not saying either or, but we do want to say that we can't accept that engagement with men should only happen because they will be saviors. And our claim is we wanna protect women's rights we want men to be part of that process and not protect women, keep them in their homes. And during the pandemic, we have seen this, this surveillance, the policing of, you know, using a health pandemic to become a law and order pandemic and using that to decrease mobility for women, using health arguments uh, to have more surveillance over women. So I wanna speak about our work around gender-based violence. A lot of us use this terminology interchangeably, violence against women versus gender-based violence. A gender-based violence approach also includes you know, issues of you know, looking at violence against effeminate boys, violence against people that transgress any kind of norms in society that have to do with sexuality, gender, and rights. Uh, I think one of the, the, the key questions for all of us today is how do we positively engage men without making them feel either alienated, angry, guilty, or paralyzed? Of course, I'm speaking about the men who want to be partners, who want to contribute. We recognize that men and boys are typ typically traditional power bearers and beneficiaries of patriarchal social norms but they are essential actors in reshaping these power structures and achieving a more just world. But we can't design solutions based on the assumption that all men are equal or experience masculinities in the same way. So I guess our work in more recent years is really been on two fronts, linking gender, violence, race, and issues of criminal justice. And we draw from Angela Harris's work where she connects uh, violence with masculinity 
that leads men to appoint themselves the protectors of racialized communities that constitutes its own interracial brotherhood linking lawbreakers and law enforcers. Feminists are familiar with the concepts of gender violence, but this term is usually used to denote violence by men against women. Yet exploration of the violence in the criminal justice system begins to reveal the extent to which masculine identity is shaped by relations of repulsion and desire between men. And this community of violence extends to state actors within the criminal justice system, most notably the police, disrupting the cycle of gender violence both inside and outside the state is a gender issue, but also a race issue, as well as a criminal justice issue. And as feminists, we need to bring these together much more. And I guess my last point is about changing our notion, changing social rep reproduction. Social reproduction is not marketized. Women cook, clean, or do housework, childcare for free. Maybe we need more organizations that are called men cooking and cleaning. And of course, that might make people laugh, but you know, laughter is where we find deep truths. We want to create a just world where there is equal pay for all people. Uh, pe men stop interrupting women in meetings, uh, give, you know, do a share housework. So these may seem like simple ideas, but in trying to create a more just and equal world, these are some of the ideas with which we can approach, we can have a feminist approach to working with men and boys. Thank you. Vandana, you are on mute. Banana, kindly unmute yourself. Apologies. Thank you, Gita, for your very knowledgeable and powerful sharing from your feminist perspective, particularly on the, on, on the changed dimensions of gender and the crisis of masculinity in the context of the pandemic. And your suggestions, some of your suggestions based on your experience of how, what we need to do and how we need to positively uh, how do we positively work with men uh, for, for equality and justice? Thank you so much. And our last discuss discussant in this plenary is a um, young man, Lucas Crimson. He's a youth activist. Uh, and you are, you are just in your prime youth, Lucas, but you have already been active for gender equality and social justice in so many ways. Can you share with us about the issues you are most passionate about and how do you analyze the global context from a gender perspective on masculinities. Why is it necessary for men and boys to take charge of generating spaces for collective reflection? And what are your ideas on the role of men, including young men like yourself in feminism and masculinities? Everyone, hello everybody. I'm, I'm very happy from being here. And I think that in, in this global context that we are living, it's very important to have events like this to share different views. And also I think that um, here I'm from Argentina and in Latin America, we are living in a particular context with a lot of political changes and, and strong tensions. Um, and also in all the world, we know already that we, we are living a, a, a great social crisis and, and, and the pandemic. And I think that in this context, a lot of inequalities are deepened and put on the table. And this implies the need to face deep discussions and great transformations. I believe that many of these inequalities also imply gender inequalities and the organization to face all these inequalities, mainly from the community are usually promoted and led by women. Communitary organization and collective care in all its senses are essential to cross this context. And for that, men have to encourage ourselves to the collective, break with the unique mandate of hegemonic masculinity that is largely individualistic, and take charge of generating spaces for debate. 
why do we suggest that we have to take charge? I believe that the vast majority of advances in reflection on masculinities in deconstruction, as we say many times, in questioning masculinity, have arisen from the great advances of the feminist movement, which many feminists consider this fourth wave. This also implies that from my experience, most of the spaces for conversation between men and boys on these issues have been claimed or promoted by women. Unfortunately, I've, I think that men often only think about these issues based on what women tell us. That happens a lot among youths. Especially that was the experience that occurred in recent years in, the, in educational areas. Before the emergence of the Me Too movement, the slogan No is No strongly emerged in Argentina, referring especially to the question of consent. In the area of adolescents of secondary schools, this came hand in hand with the outbreak of accusation of gender violence with hate and anger. Uh, the accusation of gender violence through social networks, like public but no institutional denunciations of, of this violence called scratches. And in this entails some counseling culture. These complaints were very diverse and generally generated on boys that have been exposed, both isolation and retraction, as well as the trigger for reflection on many issues. From the demand mainly of young women, men began to gather and ponder among ourselves. In turn, this developed in a dynamic that often implied a constant demand from men towards women about the explanations that we supposedly need from them and that they supposedly must give us. This clearly explains the definition of hegemonic masculinity given by the Argentine political scientist member of the Institute of Masculinities and Social Change, Luciano Fabri, that says that masculinity in the singular as a extractivist device of power, abrogating, pretends a disposal from women to men. Now, I think it's important to ask ourselves, why do we need this explanation? Surely because we find it difficult to sensitize and ponder among ourselves but also due to a great educational deficiencies. It is extremely necessary that we have an education with a strong gender perspective. In Argentina, we have had the comprehensive sexual education law for more than 10 years, and it has not been implemented effectively yet. Institutional responses to all these issues are necessary, really necessary. Because all these exposures and denunciation, the scratches, arise precisely in the face of this lack. It is a justice strategy used as a claim when there is no institutional justice. At the same time, in recent times, the institutions have also begun to become aware of these issues, and we must recognize that all these issues are being installed and discussed more and more. Returning to what I said before, I think that, that that has to do with the initiative of youth, with how the youth breaks with imposed structures to advance with great transformations. Argentine socio sociologist and feminist referent Victoria Freire says that generations are built when they manage to push the limit of what is possible. I think that that, that is what we youth do today push the limit of what is possible with the issue of masculinities as well as with many others. But what happens when we try to push that limit of what is possible? What happens when we propose great transformations? It is clear throughout the world, the strong emergence of hate speech, fractionary speech, where the forms of hegemonic masculinity, violence of all, of all kinds are clearly observed. Here, I think it's important to note that these issues are often reflected in politics, in those reactionary speeches, but in our actions in the world of politics as well, as well as everywhere, but political violence is often made invisible. In front of this, I think that once again, rethinking the collective and taking charge of that is fundamental. Build collective spaces that are not of male complicity, but that break with that 
and earth spaces for cohabitation. It's important that these cohabitations go through us as, a regu as, as regular thoughts and also thinking about the importance of transversality. Thinking about politics and the construction of large social movements, I believe that this transversality is fundamental from an intersectional perspective. This great tool that feminism brings is important when thinking about masculinities too. We are talking about masculinities in the plural because there are different ways of inhabiting it, and this topic also intersects with many others. For example, in Argentina, we are working hard on the, on the comprehensive and participatory development of a perspective to address masculinities in poor neighborhoods, which in turn is the link to the problem of substance use. For this, I consider that also international networks like this are fundamental. We have worked for many years in the Latin American meeting of anti-patriarchal men, meeting annually with colleagues from different countries and also promoting to continually rethink ourselves. I believe that the generation of all kinds of spaces to reflect on masculinities is fundamental. And I consider that these questions go, home, go hand in hand with great transformations that we bring from the youth, from a generation that aims to be an active youth. And as the youngest legislator in Latin America, Ophelia Fernandez says, if they, if, if they say that we young people are the future, they will have to grant us a place in the present. I think that for us men, in place taking over the task of rethinking ourselves collectively, and although we often wonder what place we can occupy in the feminist movement, I think we have to reverse the question and ask ourselves what place feminism occupies in us men and in each of our lives. Thank you very much. I think you are in mute, Bandana. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lucas, for bringing that very fresh, youthful perspective, you know, sharing your experiences, particularly on how the education system is so very instrumental in bringing that change, you know, and, and of course, the, the, you, the future is yours, you know, and we really look up to youth like you uh, to promote that generation equality that the United Nations, particularly UN Women, is seeking to, uh, you know, do in the, in the, in, in the coming years. I'm, I'm, my apologies, we cannot go on a second round, we had thought so, but we are very behind time. So I would really like to thank the speakers who brought some very substantive issues to this very interesting dialogue in terms of collaboration, power sharing, interconnectedness, intersectionality, uh, you know, addressing um, uh, toxic masculinity and promoting positive masculinity. So thank you so much. And we really look forward to, to, to see that these commitments and sharing of ideas takes uh, roots in many of um, uh, the countries and the, and the communities that we work in. So thank you, Asa, Darren, Gita, and Lucas uh, for your very, uh, very, very interesting and profound conversation and your dialogue and your sharings. Thank you so much. We have come to the end of the first part of the opening plenary and I hand over to our MC Regi Thiabi, please. Thank you. Okay, thank you so very much. Thank you. And uh, yes, you know, I, I, all the speakers were so formidable their contribution and food for thought. I got a sense that it's all very well to talk about um, what we've achieved, but we have to be just as candid talking about what we are not doing right. I was particularly moved by Darren's reflection, which are true about how the voices of women from the global South are constantly uh, excluded or muted uh, when issues that affect them are, are being discussed. And we all know, those of us who come from this part of the world, that women and girls activism is exactly what is keep, keeping our societies together. In fact, I would even hazard a guess that having followed uh, the US elections, it is women, particularly black women, who have been striving for democracy, who have been striving for social justice. So um, uh, lots put on the table there. But I do want to take a moment to acknowledge Lucas, because Lucas, you seem to have 
excited a lot of our participants and I identify with that excitement because always when we hear from young people, it, it gives us a little glimpse into the kind of future we can have if we invest in these voices and cultivate these voices and include them in decision making. So Lucas, wherever you are, there's been a lot of reaction to your contribution and many people are, are looking forward to, to watching you and hearing more from you. We're just going to take a moment to remind ourselves of what the symposium is all about. Again, what does Ubuntu mean to you? Para mí Ubuntu es humanidad, es trabajar en equipo por un mundo mejor, es comunidad, es integrar y aceptar las diferencias porque no podemos ser en la medida en que los demás no tengan derecho a ser. What empowers me empowers you. What diminishes me diminishes you. I believe it encapsulates the spirit of the golden rule. Care, dignity, justice, equality and belonging. Le fait d'exister et d'être respecté en tant qu'une personne humaine. Je me sens mieux fort quand j'ai des efforts et travaille au sein pour avoir une société juste, équilibrée et sans violence. Humanity. It does not discriminate on gender. A human being is a human being. Mutual attributes that make people dependent to each other. Uh, tapping the best qualities of, of each and everyone in the community and making uh, use of it. Using that one thing that ties us together, being humanity, to triumph over social injustices and to use it also for social development. Coexistence and caring for each other. Being supportive of each other, uh, it's uh, like considering others as yourself. Being whom you should be as a human being before being corrupted by the societal sexist pressure. La vida de los varones solo tendrá sentido cuando puedan reconocer a mujeres, niñas y niños como sus pares. Pour moi, Ubuntu signifie. To me, Ubuntu means. Para mí, Ubuntu es. Absolutely inspirational. I think I'm muted now. Let me just see if I can find my. Oh, there we are. Absolutely inspirational. Thank you so very much for all of you sharing what Ubuntu means in your different languages and perceptions. Before we move on to uh, the second part of our conversation today, I do want to read the following inputs um, uh, from our participants. Some reflections shared by our participants, I'll read this one from Zimbabwe, Nyaranzai says, very interesting uh, point, Darren, on culture, interested in taking this forward in our work on ending child marriage. Obi from Nigeria says, fully agree with Darren when he says, we have not put the problem solvers at the center of our strategies. Solutions come through collaboration and cooperation. Um, Fakundi says, thank you, the interventions are very good. I wanted to see what strategies they have or think can help calm the hostile climate that LGBTQI people suffer in this reactionary context that has been increased by COVID-19. And we have another anonymous attendee saying, so glad issues of white supremacy have been raised. And I think Gita, you went there uh, with such uh, detail and intentionality. So so glad issues of white supremacy have been raised. We have skirted around this for far too long in the, gen in the GBV space generally, but also in the men and boys space particularly. So thank you so much for your inputs. Keep them coming. Uh, let's keep the conversation going. And of course, continue to tweet, continue to post your pictures and continue to engage with this um, with the debates that we have put together for you okay so bandana with that I, in, I introduce you again no need to introduce you but we have the second part of our conversation just to remind you uh the the the, the, the dialogue 1a that's what i'll call it it was really about reflecting on how gender patriarchy and masculinities shape our world today and we could continue the second part of that over to you bandana Unmute. Sorry. Do we have bandana? If you can just unmute. Can you hear me now? 
Yes. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Yes. There's something wrong with my mic, so apologies for that. But Reddy, thank you so much. Such a warm and such a clear explanations. You know, you 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 emanate a lot of warmth and love and connectedness. Thank you so much. So welcome to the to the second part of the opening plenary. And as in the first plenary, we have leading voices from different background who represent various sectors and approaches. They will take stock and shine their views on how gender, patriarchy, and masculinities influence and shape the world today. They will set the stage for the scale and scope of today's challenges, particularly on what is the greatest concern about the current state of our world, how do men, masculinities, power, and accountability contribute to the problem and also in finding a solution? And how can we collectively resist worldwide challenges and be part of the global movement for transformation? So uh, may I, I, I have the honor to introduce the profound discussants today of this plenary. The first discussant is Nyasha Fanisa Sithol. I hope I pronounced that right. She's from Girls and Women's Rights Advocate and Champion, Athena Youth Network from Zimbabwe. Nasha Sithol is a dynamic young feminist leader and an advocate on sexual and reproductive health, HIV and AIDS and gender equality with a special interest in girls and women's health and community development. Nasha is the co-founder and trustee of My Age Zimbabwe Trust, a youth-led organization focusing on youth developmental issues. She's also working with the Athena Youth Network as a national trainer for the Ready to Lead project aimed at improving leadership skills for young women on advocacy and mentorship. And our next speaker, who I know very well and I respect and admire, she's a good friend of mine, Tarsila. I have the pleasure to welcome you, Tarsila Rivera Zia, is a feminist indigenous leader from Peru. She's director of Chira Park and member of the UN Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues. She is a leader in the movement of indigenous women of the Americas. Tarsila has devoted over 30 years of her life to defend and seek recognition and acknowledgement of indigenous people's rights and cultures. As a child, Tarsila became a domestic worker in exchange for education, learning Spanish only at age 18. And she founded Chirapak in 1985 and has led it to become a leading agency for the rights of indigenous women. And I would then like to welcome Preston Mitchum, Director of Policy of URGE, Unite for Reproductive and Gender Equality, USA. He's a black and queer attorney, writer and public speaker. As Director of Policy, Preston shapes state and federal strategies and policies that center the voices and leadership of young people in the South and Midwest. He has served as senior legal and international policy analyst with Advocates for Youth and many other institutions. And our other speaker is Dr. Lina Abirafe, who is the executive director of the Arab Institute for Women at the Lebanese American University. The institute was established sorry, the inst in 1973 as the first women's institute in the Arab region. Lina has spent over 20 years in development and humanitarian contexts in countries such as Afghanistan, Haiti, Democratic Republic of Congo and my own country, Nepal, as well, focusing on gender based violence and prevention and response. And uh, our last speaker is Ib Peterson from Denmark. He is the Assistant Secretary General, Deputy Executive Director of UNFPA. Prior to joining UNFPA, he has served as Director for the Department of Migration, Conflict and Stabilization of the Danish Ministry of Foreign Affairs and brings to the position over 30 years of experience within the spheres of bilateral and multilateral affairs of development. He has experience uh, uh, being a state secretary of several of the countries in the Middle East, Africa, Asia, Latin America, and has served with the United Nations from 2007 until 2009 uh, with the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. So here we have a lineup of very, very you know, profound, dignified uh, speakers and uh, we will now move on to the discussion. I would like to say that each of the speakers will have eight minutes. 
and our first speaker is Nasha Fanisa Sitho. I'm looking forward to a very interesting, substantial dialogue. As a young feminist leader and activist who has for a long time been advocating for equality and the rights of young women and girls, and who has been leading community-based approaches to work with young people in feminist mobilization, Nasha, what are you hearing from the young women and girls in the communities with regards to the work on engaging men and boys? Do they feel this work is contributing to achieving their dreams of equality and justice? What does accountability mean and look like to you when centering feminist principles? And what do you expect from us, the audience, Men Engage Alliance, when we say we will strengthen accountable practices? Over to you, Nasha. Awesome. Uh, good afternoon, good morning, and good evening, everyone. And thank you so much, Bandana, for the great introduction. And you did pronounce my name very correctly. So I'm just going to put my video for a little while and I'll switch it off so that my data does not get to play games with me. Uh, but you continue to hear my lovely voice and I'm sure everybody has seen me now. So I'm going to switch off my video. So um, I'm very excited to be part of this uh, conference. And uh, I really love especially the theme, which is talking about Ubuntu. Because coming from an African country, Zimbabwe, when we talk about Ubuntu, we are talking about the values, the traditions, and everything else that makes us or form, forms us as a community or as a society, and how we get to support and engage with each other. So um, with the question that you have just posed to me, Banana, I'm so excited to be part of this conversation. And I totally acknowledge all the panelists who have spoken before us in the first session. And I agreed most of the conversations that were done to talk about issues of intersectionality, vulnerabilities of adolescent girls and young women and women to discuss about issues of what we can do to ensure nobody's left behind as we're looking into promoting issues of gender equality and promoting gender equity. So um, with the engagement of men and boys, I'll be very realistic. I think when this conversation started for some of us or young people like us, at first we felt that this is like a threat. Here again comes men to take over our space that we think it is ours. But then it is over time that we have realized actually without this kind of collaboration between men and women in terms of promoting gender equality and equity, what it means is we will continue retrogressing and even the gains or the conversations that have people have since had since Beijing uh, in 1995 will not be successful and will not get anywhere in achieving the targets for gender equality. Hence now with a great understanding, what does it mean when you look at um, the engagement of men and boys in the work of adolescent girls and young women and also in promoting gender equality. What we've realized over time is that through the work that we've been doing in the region is Athena Network and also extensively in the advocates that have been carrying out in the region, is that the engagement of men and boys really helps a lot in dismantling harmful gender and practical norms that we are currently struggling with as a community or as a world. Because what we know that the structural drivers around um, gender inequities in our societies are mostly based on how the communities we come from are patriarchal in nature, and how some of these harmful gender norms really detract whatever conversations or progressive discussions that we might have when we're talking about gender equality and equity. So we have realized that being able to have men on board and having these robust discussions together also helps in dismantling such. Then another thing that we have also realized is that there's quite a lot of misconceptions around what is gender, what is gender equality, what is gender equity. And some of those misconceptions were deeply rooted in how our societies view gender as a social norm or how our societies define gender as a social norm. And for us to be able to really dismantle this kind of uh, misconcept around gender and gender equality, it has been very useful to be able to engage with men and boys and be able to sit together on the same table and have a robust discussion or conversation, which is free and frank to discuss on the dynamics that can Currently exist between men and women and how we can work together to bridge such, such um, gaps and challenges. And then we have also realized that um, working together with men and boys is really uplifted in uh, 
to communities, societies, and people of different genders to be able to collectively work together, to collectively work together and to advance gender equality. Because as I said earlier on, when we talk about the spirit of Ubuntu, it's to me, it speaks about togetherness and collectivism. And this has been one of the things that we have been able to manage when we are talking about issues of gender equality and equity, and also having adolescent girls and young women at the forefront of the conversation with the necessary support that they need to have. Then the other thing that we have realized in the work is that uh, there are quite a lot of dynamics when it comes to issues of um, access to resources, whether be it at individual level, whether be it at um, at um, whether be it at an organizational level, and one of the things that has really worked to ensure that adolescent girls and young women and women-led uh, organizations have an equitable access to resources is to have this kind of robust conversation with um, adolescent girls and young women, and to also involve men and boys in the discussions. And to also ensure that we highlight the privileges that men and boys have versus what girls and women have in terms of accessing resources so that we can then create that equitable balance for everybody to be able to access resources. Then moving on to this, um, this has also proved to be very effective now when we talk about accountability and how and what it means for adolescent girls and young women. So when we that means that everybody is coming on board addressing issues of gender and gender equality and the gender dynamics that exist, but also having the idea of owning feminism and its principles. We don't want to talk about accountability whilst having people redefining what we mean by, by feminism or redefining or trying to subscribe what feminism or uh, what principles are supposed to be. But I see men and boys coming through and being accountable to the work that girls and women need or being accountable to gender equality by not prescribing what we need as women and girls, but by actually supporting what we bring on the table. So I feel like for this relationship to actually work and for there to be some sort of accountability, there is need for, um, there is need for, for, for not more of a prescribing role, but also of a supportive role for the work that women and girls do. But, um, to also resource distribution, that is also one way that we can ensure accountability because we cannot continue to talk about engagement of adolescent girls and young women and talk about gender equality and equity whilst we still have quite a lot of discrepancies in terms of how resources are accessed by different populations of girls and women in their diversity. So it's very important that if men, who according to what I've been hearing in all the conversations, right now we're still grappling with that polit politically, economically, socially, what we are seeing is there's quite a lot of um, leadership that is being portrayed by men and we need to shift that dynamic. And for us to be able to do that, we look at the issues of what resources are available for girls and women to use for them to be able to engage in this decision-making platforms and spaces. So for me, the role that men and boys can play is to be accountable that for now, they sort of are the custodians of resources and what should they do to ensure that there's equitable access for everybody in order to engage and to promote and advance issues of gender equality. And then one other thing um, that also helps when we talk about accountability I think it's also very important to take accountability from just a mere discussion, but how do we practically implement accountability? What strategies or what tools do we have in place that can enable organizations working around gender equality to be able to hold themselves accountable internally, to be able to hold processes to account, to be able to hold um, engagements or platforms that people can speak around gender equality to account. So I think um, basically from our end, uh, it has been quite um, a learning phase, a learning engagement to see the new event of how we can engage together with men and boys in our discussion. And it has been uh, something that has promoted the leadership of adolescent girls and young women. However, it's still, they still need to work on a lot of how this partnership or dynamic works. 
so that we don't continue again having that overbearing uh, patriarchal nature that usually happens whenever you have men and boys. And another thing that uh, we need to also look at is whenever we're having this kind of conversation, it's beautiful to see all the men who might be around here sitting in this forum, listening to us talking about gender equality and everything. But I always say that charity begins at home. So it's also very important that when we start to practice to talk about gender equality and accountability, it's not all about the work that we do, which is our state. It's not about the advocacy work that we are doing, that we speak on forums or we speak people to know us. But it's also about in our families, where we are coming from, are we practicing that? In our communities, are we also practicing that? And in every space that we engage, are we also practicing that? So I think that's it for me from now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Nyasha. Am I still unmuted? Hello? Yes, you are. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you, Bantana. Oh, all right. Okay. Because, you know, I, I'm not having the signal of the mic, so I really don't know what's wrong. So thank you, Nasha. That was a very passionate, passionate intervention, I think, you know. And uh, just to sum it up, I think it's very necessary to know the dynamics between men and women and how uh, to make, um, uh, you know, this, this partnership work. You, you highlighted the, the, the importance of togetherness, the collectivism. And interestingly, you said uh, uh, young girls, you know, adolescents, they need more resources and men need to be more accountable to how they address this. So I think accountability, transformation, partnership, togetherness, interconnectedness, all the themes of this uh, Ubuntu symposium. I think you highlighted some of those. Thank you very much, Nasha. And our next speaker is Tarsila from Peru. And uh, I know Tarsila is a very, very powerful, influential activist from a region, not just a region, internationally. She's a known um, indigenous activist internationally. And as an international leader, you've been able to bring so much of the issues of indigenous population from a gender just angle at the global level. So given the theme of this symposium, uh, what can we learn from indigenous communities and cultures on the issues of humanity, and equality. In your work, I am sure you are working with men and boys. Uh, what have you been your experiences in, in, in engaging with men for equality and justice? And what do you think is going well? And what do you think is not working? So Tarsila, over to you. Muchas gracias, uh, Bandana. Muchas gracias, uh, a organizadores de este simposio tan importante donde podemos expresarnos con libertad acerca de las propuestas que tenemos y eh, nuestros, diría yo, nuestras aspiraciones para lograr justamente el respeto y la igualdad con los otros, pero también entre nosotras y nosotros, porque ese es el, el problema. En mi experiencia personal, eh, les comento que vengo de una civilización precolonial donde el pensamiento de los mayores era, por ejemplo, hablar del equilibrio. O sea, las cosas valen cuando están en su punto de equilibrio y esto es aplicable, por ejemplo, en la relación con la naturaleza, en la relación de hombre-mujer, mayores, menores, ¿no? Y, y entre los miembros de la familia y la comunidad. Y indagando y conversando con los mayores y haciéndoles ver que esa relación de equilibrio está en total conflicto porque aparecieron desigualdades, eh, privilegios, y un concepto que estamos tratando de, de ponerlo en público es el concepto del racismo. Pero racismo no reducido solo a la cuestión étnica este, racial, sino el racismo como ideología. O sea, como una forma de pensamiento de no poner en justo valor a los que consideramos diferente a nosotros. 
Entonces los pueblos y culturas del mundo que teníamos una forma de actuar, de vivir en, en ese contexto eh, de relación con la naturaleza, pero también entre nosotros, hemos visto cómo a partir de las invasiones y colonizaciones hemos entrado en desequilibrio. Porque esta región, por ejemplo, eh, tiene mucho que cuestionar los programas de evangelización que vino con los colonizadores, donde se nos oh, empieza a hacer creer que somos parte de la costilla de Adán y no parte de esa humanidad donde hombres y mujeres eh, hemos nacido de la naturaleza y tenemos roles eh, que nos obligan a relacionarnos en equilibrio, en armonía. Entonces, a partir de la lectura de la realidad actual, donde eh, en las comunidades se privilegia la educación y la formación de los varones, de los niños varones, donde eh, la pobreza económica también posterga las aspiraciones de las niñas, donde eh, el no acceso a la educación de las niñas eh, eh, ha ido desequilibrando los derechos y las oportunidades que todas debemos tener. En ese sentido, estamos más bien en una etapa de querer recuperar ese equilibrio de respeto y de relación entre nosotros, pero también en la relación con la, la naturaleza, o sea, con los recursos naturales que nos da la vida, porque esa filosofía de de sabernos parte de la naturaleza, mueve y aplica y se aplica para todo. Entonces, cuando hablamos específicamente de la, del desequilibrio en, en las relaciones de género o las in, inequidades o desigualdades, lo llevamos, por ejemplo, a la injusticia. Entonces, como pueblos originarios, pueblos indígenas en países colonizados, Lamentablemente todavía estamos en un sistema que tenemos que seguir, eh, sí, pues normas impuestas de una manera o de otra. Entonces, eh, las mujeres en ese contexto, por ejemplo, las mujeres indígenas o de sectores populares y niñas que no tienen las mismas oportunidades que los niños, estaríamos en peor situación de vulnerabilidad contra, o sea, para ser objeto de violencias o de no acceso, por ejemplo, a trato digno o a empleos dignos. Entonces, todo esto nos, nos obliga a mirar qué es lo que pasa. Y en la experiencia que tengo yo es que los hombres son los que ejercen el poder, las decisiones también en las comunidades. Entonces, cuando hablamos, por ejemplo, del embarazo adolescente o de los matrimonios adolescentes, que muchas veces se ve como que se trata desde afuera, como que fuera un, um, una práctica cultural indígena, entonces empezamos a hablar con los líderes varones, y cuando uno les pregunta si quieren una situación de negar oportunidad de desarrollo integral para su hija, su niña, ese líder dice no. Entonces empezamos a analizar el contexto y comprobamos que si los varones tuvieran las mismas oportunidades de reflexionar, de analizar y de entender la necesidad de sus aportes y su cambio para lograr eh, las, uh, y la igualdad de género o el mismo trato y oportunidades para niñas y niños, pues hay oportunidad. Pero lo que hace falta, vemos, es una eh, apropiada estrategia de intervención en cómo dialogar a partir de lo que es la propia cultura, ¿no? Eh, estamos muy consternadas con eh, 
muchas expresiones de violencia sexual, por ejemplo, en la región, de que no solamente es con las niñas, también con los niños. Entonces esto obliga a mirar qué está pasando con nuestra humanidad, qué está pasando con la sociedad y qué está exacerbando que los hombres sean vistos como unos monstruos que son incapaces de reflexionar y de respetar las normas básicas de, la, de las personas humanas. Entonces, ahí nosotros vemos desde el sector indígena y las mujeres indígenas que hay una necesidad de hacer un esfuerzo de involucrar a los varones, no excluirlos, sino involucrarlos y que ellos también sean eh, actores eh, de cambio y de búsqueda de justicia y de respeto entre nosotros. Todo esto lo tenemos que empezar, por supuesto, desde el hogar y desde las niñas. Y ahí tenemos un gran problema con los sistemas educativos nacionales del sistema público a donde van las niñas y los niños. Entonces, si es que tenemos un sistema totalmente patriarcal, totalmente machista, o que niega oportunidades a todas y no se cambia desde la escuela esta relación de respeto entre niñas y niños y entre los varones también diferentes, que aquí estamos hablando de las diversas manifestaciones de las masculinidades, ¿no? Porque somos sociedades que si los varones no responden al estereotipo del macho, también son agredidos. Entonces, eh, la violencia en realidad nos pone a hombres y mujeres casi en el mismo nivel y por eso consideramos que desde, desde la familia, desde esa relación que tenemos en la familia, hombres y mujeres, mayores y menores, eh, desarrollando la comunicación intergeneracional, pero también intergénero y todos con una visión mucho más de recuperar el equilibrio para la vida plena es lo que debe regir nuestro norte. En ese sentido, sí estamos privilegiando, por ejemplo, la comunicación intergeneracional entre mujeres. Eh, nos falta promover los diálogos y la comunicación eh, entre los niños también, con las niñas, y los adolescentes. La nueva generación de adolescentes es mucho más abierto para eh, recibir nuevas reflexiones porque eh, el sector indígena es muy eh, violentado en todo aspecto. Entonces, eh, y este esta injusticia o esta forma de ejercer eh, el poder, por ejemplo, con una visión totalmente racista, más bien excluía a todos y entonces eh, creo que hay mucho trabajo, se aprende mucho del movimiento feminista, eh, pero también como indígenas tratamos de comparar, analizar y, y nos cuesta bastante ser reconocidas como feministas que reivindican derechos colectivos y derechos individuales. Entonces, para las indígenas, por ejemplo, los derechos colectivos que tienen que ver con el derecho a la cultura, al territorio y seguir teniendo recursos naturales, eh, se complementa con los derechos individuales como mujeres, como personas, de no ser objeto de violencia ni en sus cuerpos, ni en sus vidas. Entonces, eh, por ejemplo, el gran avance en, en reconocer que la mutilación genital eh, no puede ser una práctica que en nombre de la cultura se quiera seguir eh, practicando o aceptando, eh, es un gran avance justamente de los espacios de confluencia de lo local a lo global. Entonces, hay mucha esperanza de seguir en el espacio de diálogo y de compartir reflexiones y experiencias como en esta oportunidad, ¿no? 
eh, hay mucho que hacer y, y en esos escenarios nos encontramos, pero es complejo cuando se viene de una cultura totalmente occidental y luego nos encontramos con escenarios de culturas originarias o culturas indígenas o nativas que tienen sus propias filosofías, sus propias formas de actuar. Entonces, también hace falta que podamos uh, trazar esa línea horizontal en el diálogo y en el análisis de las interseccionalidades, pero también en las diversidades tanto culturales como de formas de pensamiento. Eh, estamos justamente para la recuperación del equilibrio y tener vida plena como personas y seres humanos. Gracias, gracias. Thank you. Thank you. Am I heard? Thank you, yes. Tarsila. Thank you, Tarsila, for, for bringing those Uh, you know, profound and distinguished um, highlights of some of the experiences of your longtime activist uh, for indigenous issues, and particularly for, um, uh, for tackling gender equality, uh, patriarchy, and toxic masculinity. Uh, Tarsila and I have been allies since a long time, whether it be uh, UN Women or Beijing Plus 5, 10, 15, 20, or the SDGs, and we have bought practical experiences from the field to, to influence uh, global and UN policies. And I, I, and I appreciate this opportunity to reconnect with Tarsila, though we are in the two ends of the world, but we are very connected. So I think connectedness uh, is, is so very important. Thank you, Tarsila. I appreciate that and love you very, very much. And our next speaker is Preston Mitchum from Urge. Uh, as an intersectional activist and leader, Working across movements, including Black Lives Matter, LGBTQIA, rights, youth leadership, democracy, and politics. What are your major learnings that the field of engaging men and boys or gender equality broadly needs to do given the current context in the US and globally? What can we do to address and dismantle unequal power dynamics in our own movements? And what do we all need to do Um, uh, uh, need to be doing to make this work, as we also heard in the previous panel, more intersectional in our organizing, mobilizing, and politics. Over to you, Mr. Preston. Hi, everyone. Um, so as a former board member of the Men Engage Alliance, I am so excited to be back uh, and in space with everyone. It's, it feels like it's been a long time. So thank you so much, uh, Men Engage Alliance and Bandana. Uh, I am Preston Mitchum, I use he, him pronouns, and as you described, I am the policy director with URGE, uh, which is Unite for Reproductive and Gender Equity. We are a young people's reproductive justice nonprofit organization uh, working in the Southern and Midwestern United States. Um, our work exists at the intersection of policy and organizing. Um, we work on issues ranging from abortion access to sexuality education to democracy reform uh, and to ending anti-Black police brutality um, across the country and, and especially again in the South and Midwest where a lot of marginalized communities are harmed. Um, so obviously the United States is particularly interesting right now. Uh, that's probably an understatement. Uh, we have an outgoing, uh, uh, outgoing president who won't concede this past election. We have young people, black women, indigenous people and the disability community who helped shape this election. And now we must rebuild. Uh, we must build our communities as we know them to be. We must continue engaging men and boys. And we must have hard conversations around power dynamics and who has been harmed. So in terms of the learnings that the, of the field of engaging men and boys um, or gender equality broadly needs to do, uh, the first thing we must do is begin with the questions, what have I learned? What have I learned that has harmed people? What can I unpack? Um, in my experience, when we start to do a deep dive on power and privilege, it's easier to realize the harmful things we have learned in our life's course 
and the ways we can work to unpack the power um, that we have that we have. Oftentimes, this disempowering, dis decentering, and violence happens to the world's most marginalized communities, including Black people, Indigenous people, young people, sex workers, people living with HIV, and queer, trans, and non-binary people and intersex people. In the field of engaging men and boys, one thing we must continually interrogate um, is how we show up for those who are not men and boys. Um, and doing so in a way that doesn't necessarily affirm the gender binary, which has contributed to so many of our understandings of harmful and or toxic, toxic masculinity. Uh, once we do that, it becomes just a little bit easier to engage in gender justice and be in solidarity with women, trans and non-binary people. Um, and so I would like to turn it to what can we do to address and dismantle unequal power dynamics in our own movements, which is a very um, interesting conversation and one that I personally have not um, heard enough. So I'll start by saying that's easier said than done to really disentangle and disempower uh, folks who have oftentimes experienced a lot of harm. Um, you know, all too often I observe people discussing their need to dismantle unequal power. Um, but who are also unwilling to rid themselves of power. Um, it is not possible to dismantle unequal power dynamics without recognizing that a person must be willing to relinquish their own power to do so. Uh, again, this is hard to do with people who are opposed to our movements, uh, but to be honest, it is also difficult within our own movements. Uh, for example, some of the hardest conversations that I've had in, the Uni in United States activism um, is with other Black men with regard to our power over Black women. Uh, the framing is usually white men have more power than us, um, which is true, but that isn't necessarily the point. We can hold multiple truths at once. And another truth is that intercommunity and within our movement, we yield more power, unearned power, over black women and that must be addressed and dismantled. And that's for a number of reasons. That's for history, that's due to religion, that's due to um, people not really agreeing or understanding feminism and gender equity, that's due to homophobia and transphobia. Um, but it's very clear that if we do deep dives in the movement and intra-community that there are power dynamics, right? You know, again, I always describe as a black queer man, I am both, I both hold power and I both can be oppressed, right? Because that's how we actually acknowledge systematic harm. So again, I, I, to say it clear of no, power and privilege doesn't exist in a vacuum. Depending on the community, many of our power and privilege can exist at the same time within the same person. Um, and I actually think this was the note that Gita was making in, in earlier remarks. And though that may complicate things, we must always wrestle with the understanding that we must be willing to relinquish said power to really get to what undergirds unequal power dynamics. And you know, a, a deeper conversation I wanna have is related to the question of um, what, what do we need to be doing in this work uh, to make it more intersectional organize, with organizing, mobilizing and politics. I really want to start by addressing Black Lives Matter because I do a lot of work with Black Lives Matter. And, you know, so, but to do that, I must talk about the roots of intersectionality. It's a word that I've heard many, used many times today. Um, um, but so far, at least, I haven't heard it defined. And so I at least want to take a pause to define what that is by the person who actually coined the term. Um, and so it's important to talk about what intersectionality is and what it's not. So intersectionality as defined by Kimberly Crenshaw, a black woman who defined the term, um, is a metaphor for understanding the ways multiple forms of inequality or disadvantage compound themselves. So how does race compound with gender? How does gender compound with sexuality? How does sexuality compound with disability? How does disability compound with economic status, among other things? It is not simply counting identities. And in the United States, many mainstream white feminists often incorrectly use intersectionality to count identities. And that is not what intersectionality is. It is a way to look at our identities and see how they're compounded and how they're overlapping with one another, particularly in a society that is rooted in capitalism, anti-Blackness, um, you know, ableism, among other things. So 
a traditional understanding of anti-racist work and feminist work or mainstream LGBTQ equity organizations don't really tackle this in a unique or, or helpful way for many marginalized communities in the United States, especially for black and brown, queer, trans and non-binary people and certainly for black women. Um, intersectionality teaches us that we must work from the bottom up. And in order to do that work, we must center the most marginalized communities because when you center the most marginalized communities, what you actually do is ensure that people who naturally have resources and power and other allocations of, or distribution of resources, they're naturally gonna be okay. It is the people who have experienced the greatest harm that we actually must center and encourage policies, narrative change and culture shift in a way that actually helps them not only survive, but thrive. So, Again, when it comes to Black Lives Matter, I'm sure all of this on this call know, but I'm also going to state it, is that all Black lives matter. Until us speaking about all Black lives, and that applies to all Black people killed at the hands of white supremacists and systematic oppressors, then proudly exclaiming Black Lives Matter can mean nothing at all. And that not only applies to the United States, that applies all across the world. And we see that happening as young people in Nigeria are really pushing to end SARS and ensuring that people see the link of what is happening, not only in Nigeria, but certainly in the United States and the link between NSARS and the Black Lives Matter movements. So until we start marching and protesting and speaking up about the deaths of Black trans people, often killed by these same police officers, uh, then we will we'll be complicit in their deaths as well. Um, so the thing that I think about oftentimes in this work, in, in, in this intracommunal work, is would they notice when we're killed? As a Black queer man, I often think about if the will the world notice when Black queer, trans, and non-binary people are killed? Do Black straight people notice when Black queer people are killed? Do white queer people notice when Black queer people are killed? This comes back to what is everyone's understanding of identity and how that intersects with other parts of ourselves. If a Black LGBTQ person and or trans person is killed by law enforcement, how many of our voices will speak up? And if a Black queer or trans person is killed by the same people who so many of us see on the front lines marching every single day, will they notice? In the United States and around the world, when people chanted, Black Lives Matter, Black Lives Matter, Black Lives Matter, I often wondered if people noticed when Daniqua Dodds, a Black trans woman, was killed, or Zella Ziona, a Black trans woman, or London Chanel, a Black trans woman, or Candace Capri, a Black trans woman, or Nina Pop, a Black trans woman, or Tony McDade, a Black trans man. This is not about what we often hear people discussing called oppression Olympics. It is about recognizing that within the United States and across the world, Black people and the Black experience applies to all of us, but it applies to all of us differently. And that is because of how the world is shaped under respectability politics and under the foot of white supremacy. Lastly, I'll leave with this note. Black Lives Matter is intersectional. The movement itself is intersectional. So I wanna be clear that this is not a critique of the organizational structure of Black Lives Matter. Uh, Black Lives Matter, as many of us know, was a hashtag that turned into a national movement. And so I always push back on the idea that Black Lives Matter is not intersectional because it was founded by three Black women in the United States, two of who identify as queer. And they always have. On their website specifically, and I want to bring this up because it's important to note that it has always said, we affirm the lives of Black queer and trans folks, disabled folks, undocumented folks, folks with records, women and all Black lives along the gender spectrum. Our network centers those who have been marginalized within Black liberation movements. Again, an intra-community conversation. So in other words, this is not a critique of the organization of Black Lives Matter, but of the often mischaracterization of what we think it is. And interestingly enough, 
when we as a society shift the framing to something that was different than its origination, we've implicitly decided who wanted to be centered both during life and at death. Above all, we have a lot of work to do and it starts with us honoring the lived experiences of our world's most marginalized communities and who white supremacy attacks first. Thank you so much. Thank you, Preston, thank you so much. Thank you, Preston, thank you so much for that passionate uh, intervention. I think you, 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 you know, passionately highlighted the dynamics of power and privilege, racial discrimination, systemic harm, and combine, you know, connected to intersectionality and the need to speak up. And in spite of whatever upheaval it may be to build communities, we know that US is going through a very interesting time now that the whole global world is interested in what is happening in the US, you know? So, so I think at such a time, a challenging time, a difficult time, uh, people like you bring that hope to shape the future, to build communities. So all the best for your very, very passionate and great work. Thank you, Preston, for sharing this. Thanks a lot. And now I move on to our next speaker, who is Dr. Lina Abirafi uh, from the Arab Institute for Women. Uh, Lina, as a feminist activist, leader, and academic from the Arab region, what trends do you see in the advancement of gender equality and women's rights in the region and globally that you consider important for us to have in mind throughout the symposium dialogues and strategizing for ways forward? What is and is not working in the work on men and masculinities? Will you please highlight these issues or give your perspective on these issues, please? Thank you. Lena, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Bandana. I'm delighted to be here. Uh, what is working actually specific to the region, and I think also around the world, is that young people, especially young women, are really galvanized. They are motivated, they are inspired. I'm seeing with every generation, they become stronger, more articulate in their demands, uh, less willing to compromise, uh, more clear in what equality means, how they want to achieve it. What I've seen in the Arab region over the last several years is movements that are organic, that are led by young people, young women in particular, uh, that are intersectional in, in nature, that are um, that are not organized and, structures and sing uh, structured and single issue based. They are really covering the full spectrum of social justice, equality, diversity, um, and they spring up on their own in ways that are very different from the organizing of uh, the feminist movement of our generation. Our previous uh, generations are not structured in terms of an NGO, they're not registered. Uh, they are galvanized on their own. They manage to bring in many people. They include artists and musicians and people who are not necessarily working in this space, but people who are motivated to see change. The Arab region actually has a very young population. So to see them taking charge and leading the fight, I think is wonderful and encouraging. You probably have heard what's been going on in Lebanon, for instance, since October of last year, uh, public protests and civil disobedience, uh, young women, iconic young women that have uh, become memes almost um, representing the revolution and the spirit of the movement. Uh, I love seeing those kinds of things. They are out there for equality, for anti-corruption, to change the government, to resolve issues with the economy, to address the garbage crisis. Um, and solve environmental issues. So in so many ways, I think uh, that is very inspiring for me because I see that they're ready to take on leadership, you know, and we, and we refer to these young people as the leaders of tomorrow. And I think that's not right at all. They're leaders today and right now and in their own right. And I look to us as kind of the older generation and think, are we doing everything we can to support them? Are we giving up our seats? Are we sharing the table? Are we passing the microphone? Are we mentoring? Are we guiding in the ways that they need? Or have we become so entrenched in our ways of working and our, and our structures and our organizations that we're not really seeing what's happening? The other thing that's really encouraging is that these kinds of movements cross borders. And I love seeing that as well, because I think when it comes to issues of equality, women's rights, all 
all of these kinds of things are not confined to national boundaries. These issues are global. And so if we're able to galvanize a regional movement in very polarized spaces, you know, where certainly in the Arab region, there are so many divisions, there are so many regional issues, um, I don't need to tell you about all the protracted crises and, and refugee scenarios and even the differences and the diversity um, and the long running tensions between countries. But to see this young generation uh, bridge those gaps, cross those borders and say, you know, these issues are bigger than us. They are not about religion or sect or, or nationality or country or any of those things. They are really, um, they're much bigger than us. And so I think they're speaking also to the global movement, taking what they need from internationally recognized good practice, demanding that they have voice. And so what we're doing, for instance, at the um, Arab Institute for Women is making sure that every single thing that we organize includes young voices. So putting them on panels and sessions and stages with uh, seasoned policymakers and practitioners and sometimes giving them more airtime. I have absolutely given up my seat very gladly for young people who are stronger, more articulate, more active, um, and out there on the front lines doing the real work. So again, I think you know what is challenging for us is to ask, are we supporting them effectively? And so then I look at you know women's organizations and community-based organizations and the local groups that we lean on for for context, for, uh, for the long running support they've been providing to these movements, uh, the movements that have been running long before um, international organizations came in to intervene and they will be running long after. What I would like to see is that we are able to support these and resource these properly and effectively. You know, we talk about uh, letting national organizations lead and putting them in the driver's seat and localization. You know, I think this is one of our new buzzwords. Well, I have a, I have a real aversion to buzzwords because they end up hollow. And the problem is that we fail to support these local organizations in the way that they need to be supported with long term, unrestricted funding that allows them to determine the direction of, of the money and the programming. They know what to do with it. Um, and I think it's the same for young people. We don't even have a structure for how to how to support them. We don't know how to fund their movements if they're not registered or in a way that fits the paradigm that only we understand. And so I think it's really time for us to expand our ways of thinking and look at what is happening with the next generation, what is happening with the real grassroots indigenous movements, and how we are going to let them take over and actually finish the work that we haven't finished. So I think that's a really interesting challenge. And the other thing is I'm seeing, you know, you asked about um, how this is working with the men and masculinities movement. And I'm seeing so many men, Arab men, um, also working hand in hand with Arab women to uh, be able to achieve these goals. And again, because everybody comes out to march for each other, um, these goals are all interconnected. So the LGBTQ movement uh, in the region, uh, environment, uh, ending violence, addressing uh, government corruption and other issues. I think people feel like these are interconnected and they are, and it's about time we see them that way. You know, we live very rich multi-dimensional lives. We're not single issue creatures. You cannot resolve one issue without firstly creating a whole slew of other problems. And secondly, uh, you're leaving people incomplete if you've resolved one part of their lives and left them broken in the rest. So what we really need to do is look at our lives in their entirety and see, you know, what is it that, what is it that we're fueling? What is, the, what is the movement? How are we going to build whole and complete and better lives for these young people? So they have access to opportunities. So they have choice. So they have voice. Uh, for me, I am delighted to see when they take charge. And frankly, I can't wait to retire because I know that we're leaving things in very good hands. Um, so I will leave it there for now, but um, mm -hmm. I think there's some very promising signs. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lena, for, your, for, the, for the passionate uh, sharing of experiences from the Arab region. 
uh, particularly in the power of uh, movement building, which is so very important. And I think it's one of the theme of this uh, symposium as well. And you also shared about the galvanizing power of young leaders. And you also asked, you know, you, you, you uh, provoked us to question ourselves. Are we, are we leaving that space for the young girls, for the young leaders, which is, I think, so very important, you know, and, and, and also uh, whether, how, how do we plan to finish the unfinished business, which is so very important to bring these young leaders and see that they take on that thread. So I think that was very, very powerful and very, very interesting, Lena. Thank you very, very much. And now we move on to our um, uh, last discussant, but the most important discussant is Eve Peterson, the Deputy Executive Director from UNFPA. Uh, Mr. Peterson, you work with the agency in the UN system for sexual and reproductive health and rights. We know that there is increasing backlash towards women's rights, gender equality, and SRHR emerging globally. In order to achieve UNFPA's vision in terms of gender equality and male engagement, what challenges do you see regarding gender equality and male engagement? And what opportunities do you see regarding the same thing? And how are you addressing those? Very simple, but very deep. Thank you. And the floor is yours, Mr. Peterson. Thank you very much, uh, um, but let me hasten to, uh, to uh, you know, uh, correct misunderstanding. I think definitely the previous speakers were much more important uh, in this uh, panel, uh, and I really appreciated the, the, uh, the, the very fine points from different angles. And I would say, Lena, it's far too early to retire with all that energy that you uh, presented here uh, and insights. Uh, I hope you will uh, continue for a long time. And I really feel always you feel that you are getting to, to retirement age. But I do think that, that your point on reaching out to the young people and involving, uh, not just involving, but listening, working together is, is, is key also to when we talked about what, how do we engage men in, in, in the work for, for women and, and girls' uh, sexual reproductive health and rights? And I do think there were some good points made in, in uh, and we see that in our work that uh, some of these, I mean, we see young people actually uh, uh, using their voices in different, uh, in different circumstances, both men and, and, and women. And it's cross-border. It's, uh, it's new kinds of communication also. I think that's, uh, that's very important and very fast communication. We know all, all about social media and so on. This is, this, is really, uh, uh, this is really providing opportunities, but it's also part of the uh, challenges, I would say, if we look at what uh, some of the things that, that we can see, at least from UNFPAC side, uh, and, and you mentioned it, uh, Bandana, that, that uh, there is a backlash now on some of the rights, on, on many of the rights of women and, and girls. And that is sometimes reinforced through this kind of cross-border, uh, easy communication thing. So, so it goes both way and we need to find uh, the way to uh, really uh, use it in, yeah, we would say for the pro uh, progressive forces. Uh, but perhaps just a few, few data uh, first, because it is, uh, yeah, gender equality is about human rights, of course. Uh, that's the basic uh, premises of, of our work in UNFPA. Um, and we are experiencing the pushback. Let me take some figures here. This year, uh, UNFPA released uh, data showing that women's reproductive rights are regressing in over 40% um, of the country's studies. In over 40%. Uh, only 55% of women can make their own decisions on sexual reproductive health uh, and rights. And we also see appalling rates of gender-based violence going up. One in three, men, one in three women faces violence uh, sometimes during uh, their lives, and it's worsening. It's actually uh, very sadly uh, worsening now uh, during the COVID-19 uh, crisis. We see uh, uh, gender-based violence, violence in the home and so on uh, increasing. So clearly uh, against women. So we, we clearly need to uh, to uh, take that into the picture also that, that it is that this is the situation. So how do we how do we uh, address that? Uh, how do we reinforce, as I said, uh, the uh, the work here? I think accountability is key. Um, we need to, of course, engage men, and men wants to be part of the uh, solution. That's also part of the power. This is always a question of, you know, going into uh, addressing uh, social norms, cultural norms, uh, power norms, uh, and uh, it's about. Uh, Always, if you if you want to 
if, if you need to give in to something, you consider it that you give, give away power. So we need to find the equation where you can say this is actually, this should be a win-win situation uh, for, for both men and women to uh, make sure that in our case, UNFPA uh, work that uh, we can realize uh, the protection and the promotion of rights of, of women and, and young girls. Um, that's how we're trying to, um, to, to work with it. Um, promoting, uh, 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 and we have in that work, uh, actually quite a strong tradition of, of working with men and boys, um, trying to involve. I think, uh, or we know also some of the challenges are, you can, you can quite often, luckily so, get uh, some of the big role models at the highest level, a president uh, or, uh, or some other kind of, of you know, uh, powerful person to to uh, support the, uh, support the and to take on the the right policies. Um, last year we we celebrated in in Nairobi the 25th anniversary of the Cairo the, uh, uh, program of action for 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 reproductive health and, and rights and and for instance we had the president of Kenya you know committing to uh, to uh, uh, to get rid of the female genital mutilation during his period of uh, time. That, that, that means a lot to have it at that level. Then we can quite often have uh, strong, uh, strong partners at the local level, um, it's in, at, out at the communities, uh, uh, engage with men, uh, engage with traditional leaders, for instance, uh, men uh, as well there. But it's quite difficult to, to somehow scale it to, to, to do something about the scalability so you so you reach out in, in society and such uh, and you can uh, you can make more lasting um, lasting uh, uh, improvements and I really do think we need to and I don't have the answer here now but I think we need to go down to, into the data down into the uh, more anthropological uh, studies and so on and find out how is it that progress achieved actually in terms of e uh, gender equality, why is it that it suddenly is reversing? Why is it that groups, men in this case, uh, who, 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 who basically, basically were already working for, previously working for women's rights and, and you know, accepted that as a, why is it that it suddenly we have this pushback uh, um, and, and how can we address some of these things? And again, and here I come back to, um, to the role of, of young people, uh, because uh, I think that, I mean, they, they can see it from uh, from without the uh, the context of uh, what was tradition, what was so and so, uh, and they can see and they can get the impulse from other places. They can see what is actually possible. Uh, young women can stand up and say this is actually possible, um, and 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 then engage uh, with the young men. And I do think we have uh, and and we try to work with that uh, in UNFPA as well, because we have a. Uh, we come from a background. We have a we have this ICPD program of action from 25 years ago as the basis. It's a very good document, really underlining that this is about the rights of the individual, uh, woman, young uh, girl, uh, and child. Um, but how how do we communicate that you know basic thing uh, to uh, to young people today? What does it mean to them? Uh, what does it mean to a young girl uh, in in uh, Bangladesh or something else, this document from 25 years ago with a lot of long, long text and so on. I think we need to be better in actually showing this is, this is what it's actually all about. This is a, about being able to finish your school even though you get pregnant. It's about actually having knowledge about how you avoid to getting pregnant and having access to, to, uh, to family uh, uh, planning and family health uh, 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 means to, to, to avoid that. Uh, and it's also about, you know, <laughs> boys and knowing, and knowing that uh, as well. So we need to involve boys uh, and men and we're doing it. And let me just mention a few examples on how we are working with men and boys. Uh, in Niger, we are supporting husband schools uh, where you speak with men on uh, reproductive health and, and foster behavior change and, you know, explain that this is also something that you need to, that this is not just uh, something for your wife to, to take care of. Um, we work on men and fatherhood in Eastern Europe and Central Asia, addressing gender equality and, 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 and the engagement of men in care work, in care of the house, of the family. We have a, we're supporting outreach to boys in Lesotho, 
with life-saving life uh, information about violence and sexual reproductive health. And, and we are supporting engagement with men in rural Ethiopia to show, uh, again, that family planning is just, it's not just a women's issue. It is uh, both for women and men, and it is for the future of, of generations. So I think we have opportunities. Um, we have, uh, we have uh, the data uh, showing that it works. Um, and, and we have uh, we have a movement uh, in, in in some uh, in some regions, but we also have the movement uh, 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 the backlash, as I said. So it's a question of really mobilizing, and it's possible. As I mentioned uh, last year, we uh, we celebrated the 25th year of the Cairo Declaration in at the summit in Nairobi, with 100 and more than 170 uh, countries there. A lot of uh, of uh, uh, civil society, grassroots, uh, governments, and so on. And more than 1,250 commitments were made from these participants on how they wanted to, to uh, uh, promote and work to uh, implement the, uh, the, uh, what we call the Cairo Action Plan, and thereby ensuring gender equality when it comes to uh, family planning and, 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 uh, and reproductive health. So I think there are possibilities. I think it's a, it's a, it's 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 a challenge. But I think we need the way part of the way to overcome the challenge uh, is to, as I said, be better in explaining what it means to again this 18-year-old uh, uh, girl and to her brother and to uh, her father and to uh, to her boyfriend and so on. We need in that respect to to uh, involve the men in the room, not as uh, not by pointing fingers and saying, "Listen here, come and uh, behave," uh, and so on. But you know, really to to get the uh, to get the dialogue and 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 explaining and making people realize uh, that this is basic human rights. This is something that you uh, you would want to be able to do yourself. So why shouldn't your sister or the neighbor's daughter be able to to exercise those same rights? I think I'll stop here. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Peterson, for highlighting the need to address social, cultural, and power norms. And I think very importantly, you said, you know, finding that equation of that win-win situation, because many think that, you know, sharing power means giving up on a lot of your power. So I think finding that equation is very important. And then building accountability. You talked about a partnership with various stakeholders, not just engaging men and boys, but also, you know, um, um, traditional leaders, religious leaders, and the role of young people. You know, I was fortunate and honored to be a part of that exciting gathering in Nairobi, you know, on the, on the ICPD 25. And what was very significant for me was the engagement of the youth, the presence of the youth, the active mobilization and the voice that was amplified and galvanized during this Nairobi summit. But as you said, there have been so many commitments made and we now have to see that those commitments are implemented and the role of the youth is so very important. So thank you so much, Mr. Peterson. And before I close, I would like to also inform you because I forgot to inform you that we were scheduled to be joined by his Royal Highness Prince Sisio of the Kingdom of Lesotho. Uh, but unfortunately, he could not join us as he has been called into an emergency meeting with the Prime Minister. So he's unable to join this um, symposium. I wanted to inform that as well. So before we end, you know, I, I really wanted to know, you know, actually to have a dialogue, but sometimes these virtual dialogues, it, it, it limits you to some extent. But I, I just wanted to see that before the closing, I just wanted to get back uh, to the to the panelists, but just a sentence from each one of you, in terms of uh, you know one line message to the symposium participants that they can take with them. Sometimes you may forget the entire thing, but you remember those one line messages. So, what in your perspective that one line message, the most important thing would be? How can men and masculinities work and be part of the larger feminist movement? So this is the questions. How can men and masculinities work and be part of the larger feminist movement? Uh, so I, just a one line, or what do you think on the top of your head? Uh, can I start from Lena? Lena? Absolutely. Um, 
my message would be start where you stand. Um, I gave a TEDx talk a few years ago with that same message, the idea that you don't need to go far or travel to remote places to do this kind of work. You can do it right in your home, with your families, in your communities, with your, um, in your religious structures, in your schools. If everybody took that responsibility on themselves and started exactly where they stand, uh, I think that's the only way the movement is gonna succeed. Thank you, Lena. Start from your home, start yourself. That's very important. Preston, can I move on to you next, please? Can we hear from you? Of course. Um, so my message will be intersectionality is more than a buzzword. Make sure you're using it appropriately and make sure you're actually honoring the most marginalized communities and build up from there. Uh, my secondary message, because I love to break the rules, are uh, really <laughs> deeply invest and listen to young people. Young people are not only the future there than now. So they can definitely speak up for themselves. We just must relinquish our power and give them space to do so. The young people are now, they are not just the future. I like that. Thank you. Thank you, Preston. Thank you so much. Uh, Tarsila, can we hear from you that one line of message, please? Trabajemos juntas y juntos en un diálogo intergeneracional a intercultural. Thank you. Thank you, Tarsila. Very clear and succinct. Thank you very much. Nyasha, we haven't heard from you. Can we have that one line of message that the symposium participants can take? Um, thank you. So for me, my one line would be um, adolescent girls and young women have over the years been vulnerable. We have been most marginalized. We have been most criminalized. And for us to move forward, if we ever going to do Beijing plus 50, because I'm thinking 25 years from now, there will be Beijing plus 50, and us to be able to recognize the gains of gender equality. We need the space, we need the resources, and we need the support. Thank you. Wonderful. Space, resources, and support. Very, very important. Very much required. Thank you, Nesha. I think, I think we are very assured with uh, leaders like you, leaders of today. I, I was about to say future leaders, but you are leaders now. Thank you so much. Thank you. And Eve, that would be your last, last uh, sentence before we close the, the okay, plenary. Okay, my last sentence. Men and gates, be open for dialogue, be open for change. Human rights are for all. Oh, thank you. That's very nice. Human rights are for all. Thank you so much. Thank you to all of you for your very, very interesting dialogue and sharing from different diverse backgrounds related to the theme of this very, very important Men Engage Global Symposium with the theme Ubuntu. You are, uh, I am because you are, you know, I think that is so very important. Humanity is the key, I think. So humanity, interconnectedness, movement building, power with accountability, um, you know, giving space to younger people, or, or working with them, power with, sharing that power. I think these are very, very important, uh, you know, lessons that we have learned from this plenary session. And I would again like to thank uh, the, the speakers from the earlier session, the earlier uh, first round of the plenary, as well as the second round of the plenary. I myself have been enriched listening to you all. And I'm sure I, would, I should say kudos to our activism, to our advocacy, to our voice, and to our togetherness and connectedness. So thank you to the organizers as well for giving me this opportunity to moderate this, moderate this very, very interesting session. Uh, with that, I, I close this session and hand over to the organizers for any announcements you may have. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much, Vandana, for your expert uh, navigating through very complex issues. I will not be able to do justice to all the compelling substantive feedback that we've received from the participants, but they thank you and they thank your panelists in particular, especially about new ideas. And I think that's why I love doing what I'm doing because it's not just talking. You are awakened to something that you never reflected on. Uh, the challenge to really bring nuance into our interpretation and our thinking around intersectionality and what it means. Because if we understand what we are talking about, I think it can galvanize us into, uh, into action. But I also want to acknowledge, I think the vulnerability with 
with which the panelists are coming to the space. It's not just expertise because it's theoretical knowledge, it's practice as well, but it's also what we feel passionately about and uh, how it reflects the kind of world that we wish to live in. So thank you all so very much. We've received fantastic, fantastic uh, feedback from our panelists. I'm just gonna uh, read some, uh, some comments just so we get a sense of what everybody's saying. We may not be able to address them today, but perhaps going into our second day tomorrow, some of the, these themes will be will be addressed. Addressed. Okay. So, uh, some, uh, Elizabeth from Latin America says a very good experience. Thank you very much, Men Engage, for this great initiative, and thank you to the panelists for their rich presentation. I'm delighted to participate in the symposium for capacity building. Following the same thread, uh, Karin says thank you very much for your very important contribution in this fight. Salma from Bangladesh says, love to hear about the necessity of balance with indigenous peoples, with indigenous people. Uh, as a Bangladeshi, South Asian woman, every day I feel the need for work-life balance, which is needed for women and men and others, uh, for family members, especially for children. Marlon from Trinidad and Tobago and uh, says, um, Baba from Pakistan says, Preston makes compelling points and thanks for explaining intersectionality from oppression, identity, and uh, vulnerability. Is, is Bandana still here? Uh, I want to say something to you. I've got a, a, a message for you, if you can still uh, hear us. It looks like there's a charming little girl who just crept up behind you and is desperate for your attention. Am I correct? <laughs> I think that that's the... Uh, this, the family and the workplace just coming together. We all understand that. So Bandana, if you can hear me, uh, if you can hear me, one last thing that I want to say. You have been re-elected as the co-chair of the of CEDO, the Committee on the Elimination of Discrimination Against Women. We wish you the best for your tenure, you and your colleagues, as you continue to make an impact. Congratulations on your re-election. Thank you very much. I think that charming little one wants your attention and wants it immediately. Uh, thank you so very much. Okay, I've lost one of the comments that came through earlier. And as I said, the screen is re uh, refreshing at a rapid, rapid uh, 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 rate. Uh, we did get a comment from, I think it's Dr. Aref in Yemen, saying that it is absolutely uh, difficult to get the youth and women, women involved because um, the, the ruling party, I hope I'm summarizing the spirit of your, of your message correctly, that uh, the ruling party basically just makes it difficult um, uh, for these kind of progressive interventions to take place. And I think it's important to remind ourselves that activism and organizing, raising funds and so on, still has to happen sometimes in very repressive and oppressive uh, societies and uh, people are, are, are vulnerable in so many other ways, including in that space as well. So we keep that in mind as well, that not all our societies are open to the kind of activism we want to, uh, to, to initiate and not all of them are, are open to doing the cultural and paradigm shift that we so need. Another message that came through, I can't remember it word for word, but I saw it earlier. It talked about uh, responsible investment, that that should really be a focal point as well, that we don't talk enough about responsible investment and asking if we had a World Bank panelist here. That's something to keep in mind for the future, because it's true. We need resources to do the work that we're going to do. Are we investing in institutions organizations and even initiatives that are actually regressive and that frustrates the work that we're trying to do. We ought to think quite uh, intentionally about responsible investing so that the resources, the support goes to the progressive organizations that will further uh, uh, enhance the work that we're doing. So that's some of the feedback that has come through. Thank you so very much. Okay, we're gonna cross to Rwanda in just a moment, but first, just a reminder, a gentle reminder of what Ubuntu means to me. To me, Ubuntu means togetherness. Being there for one another. Working for the equal rights of different sexual orientations and gender identities. Treating one another in a way that is that respects our human rights and dignity. Giving love despite of religion, ethnicity, caste, or whatever the discrimination or the identity that the society creates. We must work together and lift each other up. Sans les autres, je ne suis rien. Integrar y aceptar las diferencias. Unity in spite of our differences. Care, dignity, justice, equality, 
and belonging. Uh, tapping the best qualities of, of each and everyone in the community and making uh, use of it. Coexistence. Considering others as yourself. Taking care of one another and the planet. Promoting gender equality. Encontrarnos en un abrazo desde las diferencias. To me, Ubuntu means being whom you should be as a human being before being corrupted by the societal sexist pressure. It helps me really to know that I am not alone. The feeling of a connection, this is what makes change happen and this is also what accelerates change. Una oportunidad para renacer a través del otro. The power in networking influencing positive masculinity. Avoir de la dignité et de respect envers les autres. The powerful human truth. Dignity, love and respect. Coming together as a collective. My attitude and my behavior towards others. The ability to connect your heart with another person's soul by walking a mile in their shoes. In unity we accomplish. Help people in need without any expectation. Cambiar y transformar la sociedad desde una mirada diferente de ser hombre. The understanding that a candle loses nothing by lighting another. Pour moi, Ubuntu signifie... To me, Ubuntu means... Para mí, Ubuntu es... 